instead of the popular thing today, well, I, you know, I, I'd like to see somebody who looks like me. I say, I'd like to see somebody who thinks like me, who talks like me, who, whose heart is like mine, who, who, who shares my values, because that's the most important thing that there is. So thank you so much, Pastor Iverson. Well, God bless you. I'm not preaching until tonight, but you can see I'm chomping at the bit now. You all are getting me started. But, but, our, but our next guest speaker, is the, he is the Texas president of Stan. He is an author. He is a, uh, a television talk show host. In fact, I'll be with him in a couple weeks doing some tapings for his television program. I'm sure he'll tell us all about that. Uh, but he has been in this fight for a long, long time. You all remember the Houston Five, the five guys who got sued by the mayor of Houston, well, he was right in there with that crowd. His church is actually in Brazoria, so he didn't, get, he didn't get sued, but he was right there with that group of people that were being persecuted by the mayor. And I can tell you about this man. He has never, ever backed down. You can count on him to stand. You know, these people who are preaching right now, and this includes Andrew, obviously, and everybody coming, if I had to be in a firefight, these are the people I want around me because I believe these folks are going to stand. Dr. Melvin Johnson. Praise the Lord, everybody. Yes, yes, isn't God good? And I am, and I, I believe as many who are here and who have come here and experienced some of the things that have transpired over the last few days, I think if, I don't think I'm wrong, I think we've been overwhelmed by the presence and the power of God and the love that's being spread amongst us and the overwhelming hospitality. Amen? Amen, of the Andrew Womack Ministries and the Karis Bible College. So let's give Pastor Womack and let's just thank God for this opportunity. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we must recognize, and I believe we do, but it's always good to reaffirm things to make sure that we're all on the same page. And as you see behind me, there is a thought, that no truth without the word of God. It's very important that we recognize that and hold it to the utmost. There is no other truth than within God's word, there is no other source of morality All right. other than God's word. There's no other source. Right. Anything else is an imposter. Please bear with me for just a moment as we show you this short video clip. I'd like to ask for a recess. I'd like an answer to the question, Judge. The court will wait for an answer. If Lieutenant Kendrick gave an order that Santiago wasn't to be touched, then why did he have to be transferred? Colonel, Lieutenant Kendrick ordered the code red, didn't he? Because that's what you told Lieutenant Kendrick to do. Object! And when it went bad, you cut answer. these guys loose! Your Honor! You had markets inside the bony transfer! Your Honor! You doctored the logbook! Damn it, Captain! You coerced the doctor! Consider Not yourself in contempt! You. Colonel Jessup! Did you order the code red? You don't have to answer that question. I'll answer the question. You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers? I want the truth! You can't handle the... <laughs> truth! <laughs> can't handle the truth. Pastor Jackson, I call him my twin, by the way, because we think so much alike. And this is just another indication as we look in 1 Corinthians again, chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Okay? And we know that uh, the Apostle Paul 
was talking to the church at Corinth. And Paul was, in essence, venting a little bit of frustration because he wanted the church at Corinth to go and, and, and listen and hear and learn and grow. Yes, yes, like Paul said in the 13th chapter, you know, he wanted them to be or at least head in the direction to be like him, that they could uh, not, no longer think as children, okay? Uh, no longer speak like children. He wanted them to mature in their spiritual life. But the one thing about this meat that Paul wanted them to have you see, the essential element of spiritual meat is truth. Just like in the little video clip, when Jack Nicholson shouted back, you can't handle the truth. This was the same thing Paul was unfortunately saying to the people at Corinth. What about today? We are seeing some of the same characteristics about many of us within the body of Christ. Pastors struggle, pastors preach, pastors teach, teachers teach, but yet we still find ourselves back at square one. But we're gonna move forward a little bit. Where we're gonna focus is to help recognize or to reaffirm this great truth of itself, that we who are believers in Christ, we are, or at least should be, the people of truth. Amen. Amen. We, we've heard it interwoven throughout some of our sermons and our, our thoughts as we express them. But if there is no one else in this earth no other group in this earth who should have the truth to, lie, to lay at our very foundation of existence, it should be the body of Christ. We are the keepers, we are the holders, we are the believers, we are the protectors, we are the, are the providers of the truth of God. Amen. It's absolutely necessary. We are the keepers of the truth as it's illustrated in our scriptures as, as John wrote to the people of God. He said, children, it is the last hour. And this is the uh, New American Standard Version. And uh, it's a little bit different, obviously, from King James, but it means the same. And just as you heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many antichrists have appeared. From this we know that it is the last hour. And John went on to say, because that was something that had happened, he said, they went out from us, but they were really not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have what remained with us. But they went out so that it would be shown that they all are not of us. I love this part, but you. We, us. We have the, King James Version says, the unction, which means the same thing, you, have an anointing from the Holy One. And you all know. And John went on to say, now I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it. And because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar? But the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ. This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. A little later in that short book, 
First John, fourth chapter, John said, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirit, whether it be of God. And then he gave us the method of doing so. He said, this is the way to try the spirit. Anyone who confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. But he who confesses not that Jesus Christ is come of the flesh and come in the flesh is not of God, but is of the spirit of Antichrist. So before we get busy trying to think of who the Antichrist is, <laughs> you know, if you watch the omens, parts one, two, and three, you know, and try to uh, uh, attach a person with that title or that position, we're talking about the spirit of Antichrist, which is already in this world. The spirit of Antichrist is prevalent. It has come to the point that those who will operate under its influence, they're bold, they're not ashamed, they no longer hide in the darkness, but they're in open, broad daylight. They're campaigning for positions, political offices, positions of power, and many of us, unfortunately, sometimes support them instead of someone who has been washed in the blood of the lamb. I want to take you back. How many of you have heard or used the expression, don't drink the Kool-Aid? And I would dare venture to believe that the majority of you who raised their hands understand and know the history behind it. One of the things I've been doing, I've been taking in, let's say, an unscientific, unofficial polling of young people. And I asked them about this expression, this phrase. Have you heard it before? Yes. And then I asked them a follow-up question. I say, do you know the history behind this expression? And brothers and sisters, about 80% of those that I asked that follow-up question, they have no idea they do not know the history behind this expression. In other words, the millennials, on the most part, do not know. And then that prompts me to ask a third question, or it's more of an expression myself. I apologize to them because I confess that we have let them down. They do not know because we haven't taught them, we have not told them, and they have no idea. And this, in my opinion, is one of the primary reasons we have so many, uh, so many millennials today are saying, I, well, I love socialism. And that's what they want without knowing anything about its history. So what I want to do is take a little time and share with you and, and in particularly maybe quite possibly introduce uh, this part of, I, I, I have to say church history, people. I'm sorry. 
it was a bad and tragic time. 41 years ago. Many of you already know what I'm going to say or where I'm headed with this. But let's take a look. How many of you remember Jim Jones? Wow. Some still may not remember, some still may not know. But we of the baby boomer generation, many of us, well, some of us were, could have been young, teenage, young adult, and even more mature. But we can remember on the most part what happened during that time. But I have some startling facts I want to share with you concerning the Reverend Jim Jones. Number one, I think we all agree that he was a highly admired uh, preacher and pastor of thousands of people. And at this time, at the pinnacle of his work, he was based in California. How many of you knew that Jim Jones was actually a communist and a member of the Communist Party? Yes, he was. How many of you recognize or, or know, knew or know that the Reverend Jim Jones was the kingmaker in the political realm in the uh, 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 San Francisco, Oakland Bay Area, which even grew to control California from San Francisco all the way down to San Diego. And as you see the last point, they eventually confessed and became bold about it. He became arrogant about it to tell people, yes, he was truly an atheist. But the question is, how can someone who's a member of the Communist Party, someone who was an atheist, become a respected preacher, a pastor, a leader within the Christian community at the same time not even believe in God. I would say it's quite simple, but I won't say that much. But one thing I can share with you, you see, socialism is an imitation of, Christ, uh, of Christianity and even the work that we do, it can pose, it can masquerade as a part of Christianity. If we remember Jim Jones, we, we remember the fatalities, the, the tragedy. It's, it's, it's called the Jonestown Guyana tragedy where approximately 913 people, they lost their lives. Whether they willfully took the cyanide laced Kool-Aid, some were held down and injected with, uh, with, with, with uh, cyanide uh, uh, concoctions. Babies, small children, we're given the drink in a cup and you know, you give it to a child, what's gonna happen? And a few at that point when they recognized, even though Jim Jones and his group, uh, his followers, the, his lieutenants, uh, they, they had uh, already instituted when they got to Jonestown. And by the way, that's in South America. That's on the South American continent. Uh, when they got there, uh, they had already start doing drills where they would pretend to go through a suicide pact. But this last one was the real thing. Some people who all recognized that it wasn't a drill anymore, they tried to escape, they were shot. 
So approximately 913 people died there and 68% numerically, about 620 of those people who died were black. Over half of those people who died there were women. A little over 300 of those were children. This is what it led to. You see, people, we got to understand this. And I'll present it in this manner. Socialism is false Christianity. It has many of the qualities and many of the characteristics of doing good, helping others, benevolence, you know, uh, uh, love. Uh, when you listen to the discussions uh, of those who are supporting this system, they're talking about equality. No one has to worry about going hungry. They put a roof over their heads, over your head. All of these things are in the socialist agenda. Oh yes, they are great imitators of Christianity, actually to the, to the point where it has infiltrated many of our churches today. Can I say that again? Socialism, I'll say it slower. Socialism has infiltrated many of our churches today. You see, when the truth of God's word is removed, lies fill the vacuum. When Jesus is taken away, a false Christ, a false leader, a false savior steps into that empty space. As we can see, and, and I'll give you a little background about Jim Jones, him actually being a communist, being a, a, a member of the Communist Party and supporting people like, well, he studied Joseph Stalin and Mahatma Gandhi, not saying Gandhi himself was a communist, but he was not Christian. Am I right about that? Karl Marx, oh, he, 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 he's the father of socialism as well as communism. As a matter of fact, Karl Marx believed that socialism is the halfway point from capitalism to socialism to communism. And I've always phrased it this way. Socialism is when the people believe that government is God. Communism is when government becomes God. Let's look at this scripture in Acts chapter four, verse 35b. It's the second part of that verse 35. And obviously as we know that the day of Pentecost had come, the church was coming together. At this point, People, they went, they were going and selling their very possessions, houses and land and all, all, all things like this. And they brought the proceeds, the monies, and they laid them where? At the apostles' feet. A little word of caution. Sometimes I see People raising, you know, bringing, uh, like if I were to stand up here and all of a sudden you all would start coming up and throwing money down at my feet, you know, be, be very careful. Because what I've seen after they put the money at, their, at the uh, preacher's feet, they pick it up and put it in their pocket. That's not what Acts 435B is uh, uh, and, and that, that period. Of the, of the development and the building of the church. Uh, that's not what that was about. Those 
proceeds, those monies were raised for the operation of the church itself. That's what that was all about, okay? All right, let me hurry up and move forward. And, and, and it says, and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. So that's what the monies were, were, were being gathered for, that they could take care of people who had a need. Now, there's another phrase. I want you to focus on this for a moment. It says, from each one according to his ability to each one according to his need. As a matter of fact, that second statement can be uh, interpreted or construed as being another biblical translation. But it's not. That is the saying of Karl Marx. And using a side-by-side -side comparison, we can see that there is such a, a, a closeness as far as the interpretive uh, value that I present before you today. It's easy to see that can be mistaken and used for another purpose. Let me explain this. You see, in Acts 4.35b, the people were motivated. They were moved by love and the movement of the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, to go out and do what they did. The second statement by Karl Marx is not, not about that. This depends upon the power of the governmental system to get money from you that it can do what it wants for others. But one thing about when you give, not grudging the law of necessity, for the Lord love is a cheerful giver. You give is because you love the Lord and you love people that you want to help. You do it motivated strictly and only by love and God loves you for that. And you feel good when you do that. How many of you feel good when the government takes money from you? to just throw away over here for somebody else who does not and nobody says thank you on that case. It actually creates a different spirit. Uh, 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 you, you, you might end up feeling resentful because it's taken from you. It's not what you voluntarily give from your heart. And this is what's going on today. And this is what's causing a lot of our confusion and animosity and, and the things. And so I, I, as I go forward on this, I want to present to you this little diagram, okay? The top line is biblical Christianity. And we deviate from God's word of truth. We find ourselves in this particular case under the control, the spirit of Marxism. We don't want to be there. We don't want to go that direction, do we? So what Jim Jones was able to do, he was able to combine. And many of the people that he brought, to, he drew, were black, but there were also whites, poor whites, Hispanics, yes, Asians, and created this system, and they called it the People's Temple. The bottom line is this. It became a new source of benevolence. Now, politicians, you see, one of the things that they are doing is they're working or seeking to exercise their form of benevolence through the power of the federal government, or it could be state or maybe even local. But on the most part, what we're looking at is they think that their goodness is based upon get, taking from one group of people and giving it to another group of people. But the thing about it is when you are being kind and benevolent over here on this side, it ends up being tyranny on the ones that is taken from. God said, thou shalt not steal. It doesn't matter how it's taken. God said, 
do thou shall not steal. You can hire a burglar or a thief to take from someone else to bring it to you. You know, uh, in, in law enforcement, in the legal system, it's called rece receiving stolen goods. Back to Jim Jones, as I, as I move toward the closing, one of the things that he, let's say, evolved, well, uh, yeah, devolved into, he had this thought, he called it apostolic socialism. Now, again, this was a man who was a kingmaker in the political process, and he was seen as a person to be envied even amongst church leaders. Many people admired him, although he still, at this point, was being seen as someone who was not of God. But he had something that people wanted and something needed in spite of. He has a condescending view of Christianity itself. He called it a flyaway religion. Uh, how many of you heard that the Bible was the white man's system or, or, or justification to subordinate women and people of color, or all these different thing, things, and, and he spoke negatively of God? This is who Jim Jones became as he reached the pinnacle of his power but yet people still believed in it. Uh, he even used the, the charismatic movement, the full gospel movement, and, and, and uh, the gifts of the spirit, and he even uh, staged healing sessions and all these things. He, he, like I say, he staged them. There was one case of a lady uh, um, said that uh, in, her daughter was uh, with Jim Jones as far as they plotted this thing, and uh, the lady said that uh, she went to sleep and she went, uh, awakened in the hospital with a cast on her leg, for example. And, and when she, as she awakened, her daughter was there and she asked, what, what am I doing here, what happened? And her daughter told her, well, she had fallen and broken her leg. Okay, and, and even so, the hospital was in, well, the doctors, you know, Jim Jones had, uh, doctors, lawyers, he had movie stars, he had uh, sport uh, uh, professionals, he had a whole group from the entire spectrum of people who were following him. And so uh, she was there in the hospital, leg in the cast, and when they finally released her, they took her to one of the healing services, and Jim Jones told her, well, uh, I, I know your leg was broken. They had fake x-rays and everything, showing them around. They said, but tonight God is going to heal you. And so uh, he said whatever he had to say, and they cut the cast off, and guess what? The lady's leg was healed. She was running around. She believed herself at the time that she had actually broken her leg and was healed now. One of the things that he said was that what you need to believe in is what you can see. If you see me as your friend, I'll be your friend. As you see me as your father, I'll be your father. For those of you who don't have a father, if you see me as your savior, I'll be your savior. If you see me as your God, I'll be your God. And guess what? People were clapping and praising Admitting he was an an atheist by then because people did not want to touch him because so many people were following him in California. Uh, in one sermon, John said that you're going to help yourself or you'll get no help. There's only one hope of glory, and that's within you. Nobody's going to come out of the sky. There's no heaven up there. We'll have to make heaven down here. What is socialism? Socialism is the establishment of a utopian society without God. If we can do a search for uh, uh, the many, the times, let's say 10 years ago, and if you can 
Google up or look up the word socialism, 10 years ago, you would barely find it. But today, if you do it, it's all over the newspapers, the news media, all through and throughout. You got candidates who no longer have to hide and say this and try to let it come incrementally. They want socialism now. In spite of Jim Jones's sayings, his teachings, his position, yet people still saying they believed in him. But at the pinnacle of his, his, his power, he claimed over 20,000 members. Some said 5,000, even, but if for 19, the mid 1970s, just 5,000 in your membership, that's a considerable crowd of people for that time period. He said he had 20,000. The members said it was that much, that was that many, but that, it was very close. He uh, ruled California, and I'm a firm believer that all that we're seeing today that's happening in California is a result of the Jim Jones legacy. It's, the, it's his legacy, that, that which we're seeing. Because many of the politicians, some are still there. Some are still in office. This is one of the former followers, and, and, and uh, I'm getting ready to close this out. But one of his statements was, and his name was Timothy Steen. He said, there wasn't anything magical about Jim's power. It was raw politics. He was able to deliver what politicians want, which is power. And how do you get power? By votes. How do you get votes? With people. Jim Jones could reproduce 3,000 people at a political event. You interviewed with Jim Jones, if you were a conservative, you would have, don't even think about it. He wouldn't even talk with you. The Democrat Party, Jim Jones was the kingmaker from California, and he began to spread his power and his authority, his influence, all the way to Washington, D.C. These are the first person there is uh, then for the mayor of, jo of San Francisco, George Moscone. He was, he was uh, assassinated, but uh, we, all, we have Jimmy Carter, we have uh, Walter Mondale, and we have Rosalind Carter. They would meet with Jim Jones. Now, they didn't go to the People's Temple. They would fly in to San Francisco and have personal private meetings with him on a tarmac at the airport, and that is how much influence Jim Jones had at that time. So uh, these are people, you may recognize some of their faces. Jim Jones was the influence in their lives who got them into power. Yes, you, you see Mayor Willie Brown, uh, you see Nancy Pelosi, you see uh, Dianne Feinstein, you, you, you see them, and they were Support, supporters of Jim Jones. Uh, Willie Brown and Diane Feinstein got into a conflict over that power structure in the Golden Bay area. And that is when Jim Jones started to receive some resistance from the media, politicians, and even people, families started calling media, calling law enforcement because there so many of their family members were brought into this cult system and they were trying to get them out of it and it caused a lot of turmoil. That's why Jim Jones it took them to Jonestown, Guyana and we know the rest is a tragic history. I'll go through these. Uh, Willie Brown, who's still alive, he used to be, he, he was the, he was the uh, uh, speaker of the California State Assembly, much power. He was a staunch supporter of Jim Jones, and still may be, okay? But he said, let me present you to you what you should see every day when you look in the mirror in the early morning hours. Let me present to you a combination of Martin King, Angela Davis, Albert Einstein, and Chairman Mao. So in conclusion, lessons to remember. Because 
it's important that we not walk away from the truth of God's word. Church, we got to hold it. Jesus said, be thou faithful unto death and you shall receive a crown of life. We heard uh, sermons and, 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 and discussion about the three Hebrew boys who stood up when it was not, let's say, smart necessarily to do so, but they were faithful. We, we heard talk about Daniel. You see, these are our hours, our times that we must stand up far on and live by the word of God. The word of God is true. There is nothing like it. And if, if we fail it, uh, fail to uphold it, we're going to find ourselves that influence of the Jim Jones movement, that time in history. Let me tell you, it's here right now in front of us. And the issue is who's going to stand and say that's evil? Amen. Who's going to stand and say, you see, again, socialism masquerades as Christianity. Church leaders especially pastors, we, we cannot become the idols of our people, of our congregations. In John chapter three, John the Baptist, there was discussion about him and, and Jesus as he had come into his ministry and he had disciples and John the Baptist, he had his disciples and the issue was who shall we follow? But John the Baptist, instead of saying, well, uh, well it, there'll be a time when you can follow Jesus but stay with me. John the Baptist said, now he who has the bridegroom is the bride. Oh, he who has a bride is the bridegroom. He said, I'm not the bridegroom but I'm the friend of the bridegroom. I believe John the Baptist was issuing a prophetic utterance called, uh, uh, speaking of what was to come, which was the pastor, the leader of the church. We are the friends of Christ. A friend is one that is trusted, not to try to make the bride to be his own, but to protect or honor, remind her of who she is betrothed or engaged to, uh, let her know and, 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 and to stand in her defense. That's our position as friends of Christ. Don't use God's people as a commodity. Don't make merchandise of God's people. And then, just as I had opened up with making, taking the polls of young people, the, the uh, millennials, we have to recommit to them. There should not be any way in America that we have the majority of young people shouting and crying out for socialism. There should not be any reason for them to say they prefer socialism and communism and capitalism is the evil. Anybody in here willing to recommit? And like I said, those young people that I talk with and uh, they don't know, I issue an apology to them. I do it every time and I explain to them what it was all about. Will you commit, ask your children, ask your grandchildren. We got to, re, we got to educate them to the dangers of the, that are right before us. And finally, I, I, do, I do have a table. I have a book that's titled Overcoming Racism Through the Gospel. And I have a table out there. Also have a few uh, uh, flyers or handouts, there. and this is one. This is a picture of history, especially within the black community. So it's time for us to get to God's way and God's will. God bless you, may continue to keep you as our prayer. Praise God. And we've had some great things today. You know, as I was listening to uh, Cecil, and he was talking about how he used his faith to have a child, 17 years, and he just confessed it and stuff. I thought this is a great example of what we're trying to do. Because you've got to use your faith. You've got to start speaking.
but I can guarantee you that wasn't a virgin birth. <laughs> and it's the same thing. We got to pray. We got to believe, but you got to get involved. Unless you plant the seed, you aren't going to get anything. Amen. <laughs> so let's take a break here. And what time we need to be back? We'll be back at three. Amen. Remember, we got restrooms everywhere. So just spread out. Help yourself. We'll be back in 15 minutes.